Good morning and welcome to Hamilton Central online church service. I hope you had a good week and that now we're in level two that you've some form of normality has come back into your life. I look forward to being able to see you all again at um, church as we hopefully can soon open our doors and do worship back in there again. But in the meantime, we have this awesome online church service um, that we're going to be putting together with some singing and some children's stories. And um, we have a guest speaker this week. We have Pastor Jesse from Mosaic Church from Palmerston North. This is one good thing I've really enjoyed about um, online church so far is seeing everyone come together and um, do this online videos that we can share and also have speakers from other churches that can conveniently film them from their homes and bless us from our homes. So I hope those who tuned in last week from the We Are The Church had a great blessing as we were able to see all the things that God has been doing in amongst the South Pacific and um, I was truly blessed so I hope you were also. So now we're going to head into some singing so please join us from your homes and sing loudly where nobody can hear you as we sing everything that has breath to praise the Lord.
boys and girls. Hi, mums and dads. Hi, nannas and puppers. Hi to anyone else out there joining us for the very first time on the big screen this morning. Welcome to our kids' time. Boys and girls, today I've got a story for you about a horse and a snail. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful horse. Oh, he was such a fine animal. He had a beautiful long mane and he had a beautiful long tail. Oh, he was so strong and he was very, very fast. But this horse had a problem. You see, this horse knew that he was a fine animal. He knew that he was strong and he knew that he was fast. You see, this horse was a proud horse. And every day he would strut through the meadow for all the meadow creatures to see. He would strut his fine, beautiful mane and tail through the meadow. And then he would race across the meadow to show the other animals just how fast and strong he really was. <laughs> he was such a proud horse. One day, as the horse was strutting through the meadow, oh, he noticed a snail. Oh, what a useless creature, thought the horse. And he came up to the snail and he said, Snail! Why are you so slow? Oh, thought the snail. Oh, he didn't like the way the horse was talking to him. Um, snail, I think you and I should have a race across the meadow. <gasps> a race across the meadow, said the snail. You want me to race you across the meadow? That hardly seems like a fair race thought the snail. Okay, thought the snail. You and I will race across the meadow on Sunday, horse. <laughs> Laughed the proud horse. <laughs> okay, snail, Sunday it is. You and me racing across the paddock. <laughs> and the horse turned around and he raced across the paddock. <laughs> that snail will never beat me. <laughs> I'm such a fast horse. <laughs> Once the horse left the paddock, the snail slowly went to gather his friends from across the meadow to tell them all about what horse had challenged. Horse has challenged me to a race across the meadow. You all know I'll never be able to race horse. We'll have to think of a way. We'll have to think of a plan so that we can outsmart the horse. So the snails came up with a grand plan. The snails positioned themselves right along the line where horse and snail would have a race. And every few yards, the snails would be waiting as the horse raced past all the way to the finish line. You see, the horse was so proud, he wouldn't even stop to think that it wasn't the same snail. And so Sunday morning came. Race day came and the horse was very excited. Ha 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 ha, he thought, I'm going to beat you, snail. I'm so fast. Are you ready, snail? I'm ready, horse, said the snail. On your marks, get set, go! And the horse raced across the meadow as fast as he could. And he raced across the meadow. But when he looked down, he saw a snail ahead of him. How can this be, thought horse? I've been racing across that meadow with all of my might. How is it that the snail is ahead of me? <sighs> he thought, oh. and so the horse started running even faster and he raced past the snail. He raced past the snail and he looked down again and a little further he saw a snail in front of him again. Oh, how could this be, thought, how could this be, thought horse? I've been racing as fast as I possibly can. Oh. This cannot be, thought horse. 
And so he raced past Snail once again. And he raced and he raced and he raced and he raced towards the finish line. Ha 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 ha. But as he got to the finish line, he stopped. And he saw that Snail was already at the finish line. How can this be, he thought. All right, Snail, he said. I give it to you. You beat me. Well done. <laughs> Laughed all the snails. Now wasn't that a cool story, boys and girls? Yay for snail! You know, boys and girls, horse isn't the only one that has a problem with pride. Do you know that you and I can struggle with pride too? Yep. We can also think that we're more beautiful than someone else, that we are stronger than someone else, or that we are faster than someone else, or smarter than someone else. You know, boys and girls, the Bible calls that pride a sin, and God hates pride. It's one of the sins he really hates, boys and girls. And do you know what wise King Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs? Do you know if you open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2, it says this, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. You know, the race that horse wanted was snail? Well, that wasn't a very fair one, was it? And he really wanted to make himself look good in front of all the meadow creatures. But you know... When Snail outsmarted him, ha, he was disgraced and embarrassed in front of all the other meadow creatures. The verse goes on to say, But humility, which is the word opposite to pride, comes with wisdom. You know, our little Snail was very humble and he was very wise. And King Solomon said, Well, when we choose to be humble, we will hear God's wisdom. And so let me read that verse again. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But, when humi but with humility comes wisdom. So boys and girls, I hope that story helps you to learn something a little bit more about pride. Until next time, see you later. God bless. Bye. Please join us as we pray. Dear Lord, thank you for school, thank you for animals, and thank you for friends and family. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for the lovely day. Thank you that the sun is out, and thank you that we get to see our friends again and family. And please be with Jesse as he preaches. Amen. Well, kia ora, Hamilton. I hope you're doing really, really well. Uh, if I haven't connected with you before, my name is Jesse. I'm the pastor of Mosaic Church in Palmerston North. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, letting me into your home and spend some time with you on unpacking God's Word. Uh, and I also want to thank Pastor Josh and Pastor Jerry and the rest of the team for uh, giving me the opportunity to be able to speak uh, in this amazing sermon series uh, all about Jesus. So, I hope that you're blessed by the message this morning and uh, I hope that you're continuing to be richly blessed in this, uh, in this changing time that we're living in. Today, the message I want to share with you is on Jesus, the head of the church. But before we get to our scripture this morning, I'd like us to all go back in time, uh, almost 500 years. The year is 1534. Henry VIII is the King of England, and that is where I want us to take a peek into, into his kingship, his rulership. Uh, Henry had married his first, though certainly his not 
uh, last queen, Catherine of Aragon. Uh, not Catherine of Aragon, Catherine of Aragon. And uh, Henry had originally married her when he was the age of 17, which I know seems like a crazy, uh, crazy time to, to be marrying somebody. But he was actually not married to her first. First, she was married to uh, Henry's older brother, Arthur. Arthur was the heir apparent to the throne of England uh, following Henry VII, his father, but Arthur died young. Um, and Henry, though he was never meant to be the king, ended up becoming king. And he married Catherine of Aragon uh, of Spain uh, not too long after that. And Henry, wanting to prove himself as a strong, powerful king, began flexing his royal muscles. Um, Henry VIII is possibly one of the most famous of all the English kings, um, and for good reason. Uh, he was a brutal king, an infamous king, and a king which has um, probably bred a lot of um, copying and and any all that sort of stuff ever since. But... Um, as he became king, he wanted to prove himself. And so he he pardoned a bunch of his father's old political rivals, but he executed a bunch more. And this is sort of what he became known for. He became known as the king who liked to chop people's heads off. Kind of an infamous title. But his marriage with Catherine at, at first seemed to be a good one, a happy one. In fact, it was described by historians as unusually good. Uh, perhaps this is because of the hard realities of the, the monarchy or perhaps because of Henry's temper and his disposition for being hot-headed and, and also a bit of a ladies' man. Um, unfortunately, Catherine uh, intended or ended up not being a particularly fruitful queen. What I mean by that is she bore six children throughout her marriage to Henry, but out of those six, only one survived. Henry wanted an heir and he wanted a boy. In fact, the only, uh, the only child that Catherine and Henry Henry had together uh, was a girl and so not up to snuff, even though she ended up succeeding him as queen. Um, but on top of uh, all of this, the, the troubles that they had in, in, in getting a son, uh, Henry was not the most faithful of men. In fact, he uh, had a multitude of mistresses throughout his reign um, to Catherine and also when he was married to other women further down the track. Um, one of those mistresses was Catherine's lady-in-waiting, which I'm not even sure I know what a lady-in-waiting does. Does she just wait for her lady? I'm not sure. Maybe somebody can tell me. Um, but one of his mistresses was uh, Mary Boleyn, um, Catherine's lady-in-waiting. And that's that name might sound familiar to you uh, because of her sister, uh, Henry had a an affair with Mary Boleyn, but after he had his affair, he became infatuated with Mary's sister, Anne, the famous Anne Boleyn. Um, and he pursued Anne after he had gotten over Mary, but Anne didn't want to have a bar of it. She didn't want to just become one of Henry's mistresses. And so Henry decided, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to try and make this legit. I am going to make Anne my wife. And so Henry sought out to try and divorce Catherine so that he could legitimately marry Anne. However, there were a few problems with this plan. The first was that uh, Henry uh, wasn't uh, Catherine's first husband. If you remember, Arthur was Catherine's first husband. So uh, the crown actually had to go to the papacy uh, because England was devoutly Catholic at the time. Um, Henry VIII himself was a, a staunch anti-Protestant, uh, but they had to go to the crown, to the to the papacy rather, to the Pope, to actually get a special seal of approval for Catherine to marry Henry in the first place. The other problem was that the Pope of the time, um, the Pope of the time was actually uh, kind of under the control of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who also happened to be Catherine's nephew. And the papacy at the time was basically under the control of Charles V. And so there was no way that Charles was going to let the Pope annul the marriage between Henry and Catherine. Henry was in 
a pickle. He was between a rock and a hard place. But Henry was never one to just let somebody else tell him what to do. He was the king after all. And so Henry did something absolutely unheard of and unprecedented. He tore himself, and in doing so, the entire English nation away from the Pope. And he made, he founded a new church, making him the head of the Church of England. Now, he was a a devout Catholic, but he was also a smart man. Uh, Many historical figures kind of painted Henry VIII as this this brutish sort of chop all their heads off sort of guy. But he was also very clever. And so he found legal precedent and he worked with the people in his court and his politicians and he ended up seceding from the Roman Roman papacy, the the Roman Catholic Church. Um, A later Pope, Leo, no, John Paul III, ended up um, excommunicating Henry as as a result. Um, But the, the, the deal was done. The deed was done. Henry became the head of the Church of England. And England became, for lack of a better term, a Protestant nation. In doing what he did, Henry unknowingly ushered in the Protestant Reformation into England, which is now known as the English Reformation. It would take many years for England to become a truly Protestant nation. And there are certainly parts of England to this day that are still devoutly Catholic. But Uh, Henry did what nobody thought was possible. He made his own church. He divorced Catherine, sent her off to a castle to live the rest of her days and married the woman that he wanted, Anne Boleyn. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, with all the power and of the state and the church combined, In one person, Henry became what many leaders have, what what many fear leaders to become, a tyrant, politically, uh, militarily, and spiritually. All of these aspects of his rule fell in his lap. He became the ultimate authority in politics and military and also in spirituality. Henry VIII, the Floozy, the the wandering eyes, the wandering hands, the man who couldn't contain his anger, his appetites. He became the head of the Church of England. And with all the power of the world at his disposal, he could finally do anything that he wanted. And you know what? Throughout, throughout history, many men and women have used this same thing, spiritual authority, to legitimize agendas and reinforce their own authority. After all, if the king speaks for God, who are we to question him? If God has truly chosen the guy in charge, uh, then surely a divine stamp of approval must rest on everything he or she does and says. Such was the thinking of Henry VIII and many others throughout history. As the head of the Church of England, Henry used his power for his own personal, selfish political gain. In fact, the only reason the Church of England exists to this day is because of Henry's selfishness. My question for us this morning, is this our model for spiritual authority? After all, all of this was done in the name of God, even though in hindsight, very little of it in reality had much to do with God at all. When we look to Henry VIII and when we look to the leaders of our world, how are we to base how we respond and how we act within uh, and around matters of authority and leadership? In in Roman Catholic tradition, Jesus is called the invisible head of the church, whereas the Pope is called the visible head. So you have a sort of dance between the invisible and the visible. The Pope is also called the Vicar of Christ, right? Henry calls himself the supreme head of the Church of England, which if you didn't know that before, that might be making your, you scratch your head a little bit theologically uh, because that title is a little bit problematic. It's so problematic that actually Henry's later daughter 
daughter, Elizabeth I, changed this title to Supreme Governor, not Supreme Head. Um, she recognised the problem in making a human being the Supreme Head of the church. In fact, um, this title still exists today. Today, uh, funnily enough, the title that was established by Queen Elizabeth I is still held by Queen Elizabeth II. But here's the thing. We don't have to look very far to see even Christian leaders who have risen in their authority and their influence, but have ultimately fallen short of their own ideals. Even the best Christian leaders today, there seems to be a scandal for everyone that we hold dear and we respect. While you're watching this, if you're watching this on Sabbath, um, then it will have been a little over a week since you would have received the news um, that sadly Ravi Zacharias passed away from cancer. It's truly a tragedy. And Ravi Zacharias was a man who was held in high esteem by millions all across the globe. For many people, Ravi Zacharias was the Christian apologist defending Christianity from the arguments of secularism and atheism. And yet it saddened me to see that even whilst uh, Ravi Zacharias was being mourned and, uh, and he was being immortalized in tributes and, and articles, there were just as many who were highlighting his uh, past transgressions, the things that he had done or not done, or we just speculate that made him lesser in our minds. It's, it's truly sad even though the man has only just passed away. You know, I think it's fortunate that when we look at uh, the biblical story, we don't see a long line of leaders who have always gotten it right and they always uh, do the right thing at the right time and they never fail. In fact, the biblical story is full of leaders who do the exact opposite of that. Um, I think it's, it's clear that we cannot look to a human being to be the head of the church. Time and time again, we've seen how disastrous that is. Uh, We see this in the story of Saul where God begs the people, don't make a king. He will do all these things. He will levy taxes. He will take away your sons and your daughters to fight in wars and to attend to him. He, he, He will expand his estate and he will take from you. Let me be your king. And yet the people say, no, we want a king like the nations. And so they take Saul and make Saul their king. And we know from the story of how much of a failure Saul becomes. Even Saul's successor, David, the man who would later become the man after God's own heart, makes mistake after mistake after mistake. Eventually, uh, David, through his sons and through his family, ends up inciting a series of civil wars and family disputes, which go on to destabilize and then generations later, uh, completely destroy the nation state of Israel, first by splitting it in half into the northern and the southern kingdom, and then allowing the corruption and all the wickedness that was tolerated during David's reign and his latest successes to just completely destabilize the entire the entirety of the two nations, leading to death, conquest, and ultimately exile. So one thing is for sure, we cannot look to a human being to be the head of the church. All throughout the biblical story, there is a call, there is a desire for someone to succeed, for a man, a king, a person to succeed where everyone else has failed. And throughout the biblical story, God promises that there is a king coming who will right all the wrongs, who will who will succeed where everybody else failed, who will Be the man, the man, God, king, the person who brings heaven and earth back together and ultimately show what true humanity really looks like. And sure enough, God is faithful and we see this promise eventually, generations later, fulfilled in the person of Jesus. But Jesus' followers, they expect a different type of leader of Jesus. They expect more of a Henry VIII than a Gandhi. They expected Jesus to be a King David, a conqueror, somebody who would wield a sword and vanquish his enemies in the name of God. They expected a king like the kings that had come before, but Jesus was not like any king that had ever come before. 
Years later, the Apostle Paul was writing to a group of Jesus followers living in the city of Colossae. He's encouraging them to live in the way of Jesus and he shares what it looks like to be a part of the kingdom of heaven on earth. If you have a Bible right now, uh, I'll just invite you to to flip it over to the book of Colossians. And we're going to be looking at the book of Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 6 to 15. So it's going to be a little bit of scripture this morning. Um, Colossians 2, verse 6 to 15. I'm reading it from the Common English Bible, um, but you use whatever translation that uh, that you that you like best. Colossians two, verse six to fifteen. Once again, here it is. All right, so here's what Paul says. So, live in Christ Jesus, the Lord, in the same way as you received Him. Be rooted and built up in Him. Be established in faith, and overflow with thanksgiving, just as you were taught. See to it that no one enslaves you with philosophy and foolish deception, which conform to human traditions and the way of the world and the way the world thinks and acts rather than Christ. All the fullness of deity or all the fullness of God dwells in Christ's body. And you have been filled with him who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not administered by human hands. The circumcision of Christ is realized in the stripping away of the whole self dominated by sin. You were buried with him through baptism and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead because of the things that you had done wrong and because your body wasn't circumcised, God made you alive with Christ and forgave all the things you had done wrong. He destroyed the record of debt we owed with its requirements that worked against us. He cancelled it by nailing it to the cross. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he exposed them to public disgrace by leading them in a triumphal parade. Here, Paul is drawing on a multitude of word images and concepts that would have been immediately obvious to the readers and to the listeners of this particular letter. But we have to do a little bit of work to actually decipher what this means in the context of Jesus being the head of the church. So here's here's what Paul is essentially saying. These people, the people living in Colossae, they lived in a time and a place very similar to our, to our own. They lived in a spiritually pluralistic society. I know that's uh, two big words, but basically what it means is they lived amongst people who practiced all do- sorts of different faiths and all sorts of different religions. In fact, there were a whole bunch of very strange um, cults and religious uh, sort of gatherings in Colossae at the time. There's there's evidence later on that there's this strange angel cult that worships angels. It's, it's very bizarre. But they live basically in this city that is pluralistic. There's different religions and different faiths everywhere. And they definitely lived in a time where the Greek uh, sort of way of discussion was common, where you would sit around and you would debate philosophy and people would build arguments for this, that, and the other thing. And and Paul is saying here, you are going to encounter people who are going to question your faith, who are going to try and build arguments against your faith. And he's not encouraging these people to just blow away every argument and to not engage and to not have an intellectual discussion. No, he's saying that there are people in your community who are going to try to lead you astray with all sorts of flowery, good sounding arguments. And they might sound cool and they might sound convincing. But ultimately, Paul says these arguments they are void. They are full of nothing. They are empty arguments. And so Paul is saying, look, don't take the bait. Don't fall prey to these teachings because ultimately what they're trying to do, they're not trying to set you free. Actually, they're trying to enslave you. Paul goes on to say, I'm not just telling you this because I think my religion's better than the other religions. That's that's not what this is all about. It's bigger than that. In fact, it's so big that I have to spell it out. That's why he says all the fullness of deity lives in Christ's body. He says this is so much more than about what faith is better than the other one. This is about the expression of God 
expressed in a human body in Jesus. This is insane. This is mind blowing. The fullness of every God and every ruler and every authority, everything that you think of when you think of divinity and power, all of that resides in Jesus. We, we often talk about in, um, in, in like monarchy, for instance, if you've seen the crown uh, or you've, you've seen the royal family in England, you'll have heard this idea of divine right. The idea that the monarchy exists because it was God's idea. The, the queen is the queen because of the legitimacy that God gives her. She has a divine right to rule. In fact, even going 50 to 100 years ago, the idea of monarchy was so much more pronounced and more important in people's lives than it is today. Most countries don't even have a king or a queen anymore. And if they do, it's mostly ceremonial. It, it doesn't have a great deal of impact in people's lives every day. But one of the interesting things that I found in studying monarchy, especially the British monarchy, is this idea that the monarchy for such a long time has existed in this sense of, of detachment, in the sense that they are uh, sort of detached from the people and they are representatives. They're almost divine representatives on earth to inspire a greater ideal. What Paul is saying here is that idea of divine right that exists in Jesus, but it is not just divine right to rule one nation. It is divine right to, to, to rule and to oversee all of creation. Paul goes on to say that, um, the Christ is actually the head of every ruler and every authority in heaven and on earth. The authority, the divine right uh, to rule everything and to be over everything, it belongs to Jesus and to Jesus alone. And then finally, Paul goes on to describe what happens when a person puts their trust in Jesus. And he ends this section with a really curious phrase. Why don't you read with me just that last statement that he, that he ends with. When he, Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities, he exposed them to public disgrace by leading them in a triumphal parade. What is he talking about? Uh, this should make us pause and, and, and contemplate what is Paul actually uh, leading us to here? Because I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was taught that when Jesus died on the cross, he, yes, he disarmed the powers of death and darkness and the grave, but these are moralistic ideas. They're concepts. They're not like real people. But here, Paul seems to imply that Jesus actually conquered someone, that there was someone that Jesus actually humiliated. He disarmed someone in order to triumph. Uh, and in a way, the, the moralistic terms is kind of true, but Paul is actually giving us a little bit of a glimpse into his idea of spiritual warfare. Because if you read Paul enough, you'll know that he doesn't just talk about this esoteric sort of vague idea of we're in a spiritual fight and there's darkness and we have to be good and we have to be moral and all that. No, Paul actually talks over and over again about we're engaged in a spiritual warfare with beings and powers and principalities, things which we cannot tangibly see, but which manifest in our world in all sorts of strange and uncanny ways. We are actually locked into combat with beings and powers and authorities that we cannot see, and yet they have an impact on our daily lives. Um, in the ancient world, when a king conquered another king or an emperor or whatever, he would often, when he conquers the king, he would bring back all the spoil and the booty and the treasure from this conquered ruler's home. And he would bring the ruler, if he hadn't already killed him, he would bring the ruler and he would make him walk through the streets of his city while there were crowds on either side cheering as the conqueror came home and there would be a triumphal, parade a procession through the streets of the city where the conquering king would show off the conquered people, the king, the royals, the, 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 the soldiers, the generals, the whatever. And he would, he would basically show off his stuff, the things that he had won, especially the conquered ruler. And, and he was making a statement, a very clear statement when he did this. He would be saying, look what I've done. My armies are stronger my people are stronger. My gods are stronger to conquer this man or this woman or whatever the case may be. And it would also serve a secondary purpose to deter anybody who would want to come up against him in the future. 
And Paul is saying that's what Jesus did to the powers and the authorities of the unseen world when he died on the cross. Jesus disarmed them and he also humiliated them. So what does it mean to disarm and to humiliate these rulers? And what did that actually look like? And what does it actually look like for you and for me? Well, it's curious that Paul uses the cross as the vehicle through which Jesus disarms and embarrasses or humiliates the the powers and the principalities. Because in the ancient world, the cross, and many of you know this, the cross was the ultimate um, vehicle for torture, suffering, humiliation, and embarrassment. Crucifixion was horrific. It was brutal, and it was disgusting to look at. People would not be wearing loincloths. They didn't wear anything. And the cross, far from being something which somebody just suffers on for a little while and then dies, could go on for days. You could be fighting for your life for days. And crowds were encouraged to mock and to humiliate the men uh, and perhaps the women who were crucified as a deterrent for anybody else who would try to uh, commit crimes that would warrant a crucifixion. Uh, It was a deterrent and it was also a form of public humiliation. So it's interesting how Paul flips this symbol of humiliation and, and embarrassment and horror on its head. And he says, actually, the cross is the vehicle through which Christ humiliates and embarrasses the principalities and the powers of the dark realm. What Jesus is saying, what what Paul is saying here is that Jesus went through the most painful, humiliating death possible. And it was exactly that act that elevated him to being not just the head of the church, but the head, the preeminent being over all of creation. Paul is flipping the script on us by showing that it's not the tyrants and the dictators that have true power. No, 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 no. True power is found in laying down your life for somebody else. And Jesus illustrates that by laying down his life, not just for you, not just for me, but for the whole world. Paul illustrates to the church how the church should operate. How should Christians and Christian leaders operate in the world On the basis of this is how Jesus demonstrated his love for all humanity. And so Paul is saying, therefore, we should do the same, not by exerting our power, not by wielding our power, not by using our power to push down others, but by using our power in the service of other people. And then as his followers, Jesus invites us to do the same. As the head of his church, Jesus says, this is how my church is to operate. Jesus says, this is how my, uh, my church is to make an impact on the world. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples that this is how people will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love each other. And what greater love is there than when somebody lays down their life for somebody else? True power is in not in how I can exert my influence or, or authority over somebody else, but how much I can lay down myself, not just to death, but how much of myself, my ego, my preferences, my tastes, my desires, how much can I lay that down in order to bless somebody else, in order to serve somebody else? How much of myself can I lay aside, put on the altar so that somebody else can find life in Jesus? I love um, what Simon Sinek does, one of my favorite authors in his book, Leaders Eat Last. Here's what he says. You can easily judge the character of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. I'm going to say that one more time. Simon Sinek says, you can easily judge the character of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. It just reminds me of that passage in in Romans when when Paul is talking about uh, Christ and, and, and God expressing his love through Christ, talking about how while we were still sinners, in fact, while we were still rejectors, when we had rejected Christ, even when we wanted nothing to do with Christ, when we spat on him, when we hadn't wanted to have nothing to do with him, even while we were still sinners, while we were still far from God, while we didn't want to have anything to do with God, Christ died for the ungodly. And that's you and me. 
That's what Jesus' love looks like. That's what the head of the church operates on. That is his modus operandi. And that is what he is inviting each one of us into. Now, I don't live in 1534. None of us live in 1534. But I don't imagine that Henry VIII uh, had much respect for people who could do nothing for him. And the reason I shared that story at the beginning was to contrast. This is how the world works. This is how the head of the company, the head of the, of, of the nation, this is how uh, leadership and, and leaders have operated for so long. We use our power to trod down on other people. We use our power to exert our own influence. We use our power to grow our own influence and grow our own own empire, the money, the stuff, all the things. But Jesus comes in and he says, actually, no, I am creating, I am inaugurating a new kingdom. The kingdom is coming. And in fact, he says it is already here. 2000 years ago, it arrived. And he said, in my kingdom, people are going to be different. In my kingdom, we are not going to bow to the powers and the principalities of the dark realms, and we are not going to bow to the image of the world. In fact, we are going to take most of what the world holds to be true, and we are going to flip it on its head. Jesus, as the head of the church, is not the being who exerts himself over everybody else. He is the one who lays down his life. He did not come to be served, but to serve. And he says that true power is not found in violence, extortion, cruelty. It's found in laying down one's life in the service of others. That is why Jesus is the head of the church. That is why Jesus is the only being in history worthy of that title. He is the only being in history who has laid down his life truly in service of other people and who has taken on all the hardness and bitterness and anger and lustfulness and selfishness and horribleness of the entire world onto himself and has made a way for all of us to enter into this new humanity. That is what Jesus' new kingdom is all about. The cross of Calvary was Jesus' throne. The thorns on on his head was his crown. His death, his coronation, and his resurrection, the proof of his ultimate victory. It is through this act of humility that Jesus was exalted and inaugurated, the kingdom of heaven on earth. It is as citizens of this kingdom that we find new life and are empowered to help others find new life in Jesus. And that is such an exciting opportunity. As we close um, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, whenever it is that you're watching this, I just have one question for each one of us. Which kingdom do we want to live in? Because all of us has a choice. Henry VIII is kind of a a symbol for what most of us expect a leader to be like. The sort of leader that just uses their power and their influence to grow themselves, to uh, serve their own selfish ambitions and needs. But Jesus is the ultimate demonstrator. As the head of his church, of his body, we are called to a different reality. We are called not to uh, embody or to uh, copy the patterns of this world, but we are called to be conformed by the Spirit of God to the image of Christ. He is the only being in history worthy of the worship and praise and the honour that comes with being the head of all creation. And it is God through Christ that we worship, not any other human being, not any other leader. So my question for you um, is what kingdom would you prefer to live in? And it's not just something that I put my hand up and say, yeah, I want to be in the kingdom of God. Actually, living in Jesus's kingdom, living by Jesus's rules, living as though Jesus is the head of your personal nation, like you are like obeying the laws of his kingdom. That is a daily walk. So it is my encouragement and I hope um, my hope for each one of us that we would choose that daily walk, that we would choose to live as though Jesus is the preeminent being of all creation, that he is the head of the church, that he is the head of his body and that we are truly members of it. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, a new day. And Lord, we thank you for the new life that we find in you. Jesus, you are the first, the last, the beginning and the end. There is no other name under heaven or earth that we should, that, that by which we can be saved except through you. 
You are the ultimate. You are our true model for leadership. You are our true model for authority and power. Lord, we thank you for what you did through the cross. We thank you for what you did in inaugurating your kingdom on earth. We thank you, Lord, that we get to live in that reality today. As your body, Jesus, help us to be conformed to your image. Help us to give our allegiance to none other but you in our speech, in our daily activity, in the way that we use our money, in our relationships. Help us to acknowledge and and point towards you as the ultimate source of authority and power. Lord, we thank you for your example. Help us to live within that same humility today. Lord, many of us are not going to be called to lay down our life in the same way that you did, but we want to lay down our lives in whatever way we can to use our bodies, our minds as living sacrifices. Help us to be able to lay down ourselves in the service of other people in whatever context and whatever situation that might look like for each one of us. We thank you, we praise you, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining us here on the online church service. And a special thank you to Pastor Jesse for sharing that message on Jesus, the head of the church. Now for any information about how we intend to do church from here onwards, um, make sure you check our Facebook page and our church emails. If you haven't been receiving the church emails, um, send an email to the email address that's going to be below and we will make sure that you are continuously updated with anything and any changes that um, we will be doing. So God bless and have a good week and until we meet again, 